Hello, everyone. Welcome to Prioritizing Equity. I am Chief Health Equity Officer Letha Maybank at the American Medical Association. Thank you for joining us for a new episode in the Prioritizing Equity series. Uh, today's conversation is one in many ways that I really never thought we would need to have. Uh, as the AMA has shared over the past months since the United States Supreme Court's ruling, you know, we're deeply concerned about the impact of the decision on patients' access to the full spectrum of reproductive health care options. Um, on the patient-physician relationship and on our ethical obligation to help patients choose the optimal course of treatment um, and the practice of medicine overall. And so with this ruling, our collective abilities to really advance equity, to create equitable health systems and really to ensure optimal health, it's, it's actually very challenged. Um, building off the legacy of you know, reproductive health care advocacy and, and reproductive justice um, of folks like Sister Song, um, who really led that movement uh, years ago. There are people across the country who are really committed and, and committing their careers to this work. I'm grateful to be in discussion today with three powerful and impactful leaders. Uh, I first welcome Dr. Um, <clears throat> Jamila uh, Piret, who for more than 20 years has worked in the reproductive health rights and justice space and is currently president and CEO of Physicians for Reproductive Health a physician-led organization that mobilizes the medical community, educating and organizing providers, and then using medicine and science to advance access to reproductive health care for all. Thank you, Dr. Perrette. Uh, also, we're joined by Lawrence Gosting, a university professor at Georgetown University and a leading public health expert and a law expert, more specifically. Professor Gosting uh, directs the World Health Organization Center on National and Global Health Law and is the global health editor of the Journal of the American uh, Medical Association. And then lastly, and thank you for joining us. Lastly, uh, we have Dr. Krishna Upadada. Uh, Can you pronounce that for me so I say it correctly? I'm sorry, I don't want to say it incorrectly. It's Dr. Krishna Upadhyaya. Upadhyaya, thank you. So Dr. Krishna Upadhyaya is also here with us today. She is Vice President of Quality Care and Health Equity at the Planned Parenthood Federation of America. And as an adolescent medicine specialist herself, Dr. Upadia has dedicated her career to promoting the health of young people and in particular ensuring access to high quality sexual and reproductive health care through clinical work, research, teaching and advocacy. So thank you all for joining me today. Uh, we truly appreciate you making the time and being part of this prioritizing equity series um, and this very important conversation. So first, you know, I'm, I usually open this is how I've opened this all the time since the start of COVID. Um, and I think even more so than and then the start of COVID because it felt really heavy then. And, and there, there's just so much that's happening um, in our society. How are you doing today? And, and can you tell me where you're joining um, us from? And we'll start Dr. Perret. Sure, sure. And my last name is pronounced Parrot, like Mary. Parrot, thank you. Yes, no problem. Uh, so I'm joining from Washington, D.C., where I provide clinical care and also, as you mentioned, lead uh, physicians for reproductive health. I think the question of <laughs> how we're doing today, how I'm doing today, it, it depends on the minute. Uh, things are moving quickly in, in the reproductive health rights and justice space, and we're trying to navigate the the challenges that people on the ground are facing, uh, literally trying to get access to care, uh, as well as what the providers in our network are facing, trying to care for their communities as they have done for their entire career. So it, it's a challenging time. And where are you located? What part of the country did you say? I'm in DC. DC, DC area. Fantastic, thank you. Dr. Upadia? Yeah, good morning. Um, I'm also calling here uh, from Washington, D.C. with Dr. Parrott. Um, and um, as you mentioned, it's been a very challenging time um, for many people. Um, I have to say for myself today, personally, I'm I'm doing OK, but certainly um, I'm really um, angry, um, upset and, um, you know, just really feel for the folks on the ground, patients, um, communities, providers who are really um, just navigating really difficult situations in this time. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. And Mr. Gostin? Yeah, um, well, it's, you know, as you say, it's really uh, troubling times for me. You know, it's, you know, it's the Supreme Court's decision on abortion and, and, and the state's rush to, 
you know, make the United States an outlier on human rights for reproductive and sexual health. Um, but it's also um, firearms, COVID-19, monkeypox, um, all of the above. I just had an article the other day in JAMA on, on monkeypox, um, global health emergency on top of COVID. So there's certainly a lot for our country to be grappling with at the moment and the world, of course, and not, to, and not the least of which, of course, is, is fairness, justice, and equity. Absolutely. The whole point. Absolutely. I completely agree. Dr. Perrette, um, I have a question for you. And so the, the end of row, you know, places government in this um, patient physician relationship, and it really is risking serious adverse health effects, criminalization of care, um, and everything that falls under that. Can you talk a bit about the ways that policing and reproductive care actually interact? And then what are providers within your network actually experiencing with these restrictions? Because I think sometimes if you're not in the space, folks really still don't have a sense of it. I think that's right. You know, I, I would I would also say that it's not just the, the overturning of Roe and Casey uh, over the last few weeks where we've seen government intrusion into the reproductive health and rights space. This has been going on since... Uh, Roe was decided in 1973, and we can look across the country and see the impact of governmental and legislative interference in decision making about our reproductive health and autonomy. Uh, even long before that, if we take a look at the history of reproductive health and rights in this country, we know that the uh, United States has long um, worked to interfere with the agency and autonomy of those with the power to reproduce. We certainly are seeing um, that interference ratchet up uh, right. since the, the SCOTUS ruling and, uh, and states really on this race to the bottom uh, to figure out how bad they can be, how aggressively they can restrict and eliminate access to abortion care. And it is directly tied to the criminalization of communities. I think that that's a hard thing for lots of healthcare providers to wrap our minds around. How can healthcare, how is healthcare uh, criminalized uh, for some communities? Uh, because it is discretionary and it is discriminatory. Everyone is not criminalized in the same way for the same reasons, for the same actions. Uh, and often those folks who are criminalized for making their reproductive health decisions or for their pregnancy outcomes uh, are done so because they sought medical care. And this is why it's so critical that we're having this conversation as healthcare providers, because we are oftentimes the linchpin in this situation and are feeding people into the criminal legal system. So whether we're talking about people being punished for outcomes of their pregnancy, punished for behaviors that they've engaged in during their pregnancies that would not be criminalized should there not be should they not be pregnant or for people who are working to manage their own abortion care sometimes called self managed abortion uh, we see that criminalization is is not as much about uh, the behavior of the individual, but the individual itself and the identities that they hold, we know that um, black and, and Latinx and all kind other other folks of color are more likely to be criminalized uh, by our criminal legal system. We know the same thing is true for young people, LGBTQ folks, undocumented communities. So the risks are high for criminalization overall, and we see this, and we are seeing this play out in the reproductive healthcare space right now. And it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. Yes, you know, Dr. Upadia, um, you've engaged with, we've engaged with you, and um, you know, over the last weeks or so, um, you know, just around this and figuring out kind of our, our best role in, in advocacy from our AMA point of view. Um, and you, I'm sure as well, from your point of view, and I would imagine you're evolving, um, you know, as the time goes on in such a short amount of time um, and have access to many people and communities. And almost this is kind of building off a little bit of what Dr. Perret said, um, because we understand it's not just the context of access to abortion care, but it's like this whole context of just healthcare overall um, and its impact on, you know, on inequities that, that happen. Um, and so can you just speak to a little bit again so that the audience, because I want to kind of set, continue setting for the audience, these contexts that they don't typically hear as physicians, but how does abortion access really relate to inequities more broadly? And then how can, again, public health professionals 
think about, you know, in, in what you're learning right now, what have been the best ways that, you know, they've been able to help kind of navigate the space or help their patients navigate the space or help for themselves as providers, how have they been navigating the space? Yeah, thank you for that question. And I think, yeah, my answer totally follows on what Dr. Parrott um, laid out. And certainly, you know, this from the work that you've been doing with the AMA, um, Dr. Maybank, but, you know, we know that health inequities that exist um, are created and reinforced by systems of oppression. And in particular, when we're talking about reproductive health inequities, obviously, racism and misogyny, um, you know, are really at the, the core. And certainly during the pandemic, we've seen that I think there's certainly a lot more acknowledgement and coverage of, of, you know, health inequities, but we know that these inequities have really um, been evident for centuries and they manifest all across our healthcare um, system and our outcomes. You know, as an example, of course, we know that, you know, um, dis there's disproportionately high rates of maternal and infant mortality for black women and children. Um, we know that there are disproportionate rates, like in, in my work, I've certainly seen disproportionate rates of, you know, sexually transmitted infections, yeah. HIV infections among young people, um, LGBTQ people, minoritized people. Um, and then obviously we know that rates of chronic diseases are higher, you know, among black um, Latino and um, indigenous uh, communities. And so these are things that we have known and we have seen um, across time. And so right. really abortion bans are just another tool uh, of oppression that have been harming many communities as Dr. Parrott laid out, even before the overturning of Roe. Um, and as you alluded to Dr. Maybank, we know that as a result of that, that you know, black women, Latino and indigenous peoples and other communities who have faced not only uh, restrictions on their access to abortion, but other aspects of healthcare have really been leading the fight for reproductive freedom um, for decades. And so for me, as we think about what we as healthcare professionals and public health professionals can do to support our patients and our communities in this moment, we have to always keep in mind um, what people who have been, you know, experiencing the greatest barriers for many years have been advocating for and are advocating for um, and really making that central to how we approach it. And then I think at the core, it's, you know, my belief as a physician truly that, you know, we have a real responsibility to understand that these are systemic oppressions that are impacting the, the patients that we're serving, um, you know, at the core of it, we are caring for people and, um, people come to us in their context and we have to recognize that in order to provide the best care. And I think it's it's incumbent on us to really actively um, challenge the underlying systems that are really preventing people from achieving their optimal health. Absolutely, thank you for that. Um, doctor, doctor, sorry, professor, are, are you a doctor as well? Because sometimes PhDs are there too. So I wasn't- That's okay. Wasn't just, just call um, me Larry, you. it's fine. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so you recently wrote an article in JAMA, and I, I really, um, I think there's more opportunity in this and how, um, you know, law and, and medicine come together. Um, I think more so not just at these moments, but even like in, in a preventive way, I guess, or, or a proactive way, I should say, um, of, of how we better understand and work with one another um, across disciplines. I think it's going to be really important, even more so. It's always important, but I think more so. Um, moving forward, because it's what I think becomes really evident um, during this time of COVID, during this time of uh, monkeypox, all of it is one, the political determinants of health, right? And two, the connection to laws and structures and, and, and the determinants as, as it relates to that of health. Um, and so oftentimes, you know, the way that medical education has been structured, framed, the narrative around it has been, you know, we can't, we are not to be involved in in politics, and we really don't make those connections to the, the laws that are in place that create the health, whether good or bad for our patients. Um, and so I think, you know, moving forward, it's just really important that we're in conversations together and work together across disciplines. So I'm very happy that um, you joined us today um, in this conversation. And so you wrote an article in JAMA that was titled The End of Roe v. Wade, um, and a new legal frontier for constitutional rights to abortion. So can you speak to the different ways um, that overturning Roe v. Wade potentially impacts constitutional rights um, in regard to medical and, and familial decisions? Yeah, there's so much to say. And I couldn't agree with you more about the intersection between 
you know, law, medicine, and public health, and that we have to work together. Um, I actually chaired a Lancet commission called the Legal Determinants of Health mm. um, that really made the point that you're making, I thought, quite well, um, that, you know, the, the legal structures and the, and the system of justice in our countries and our world make a huge difference. Um, you know, the Supreme Court um, in the Dobbs decision, which when it overturned Roe versus Wade and, and Casey uh, versus Planned Parenthood is, <clears throat> was a, in my mind, a slap in the face um, for uh, uh, people across America um, because it, and it also undermined the um, public's trust in the Supreme Court because Roe and Casey had been settled precedent now for half a century. <clears throat> And the Supreme Court has never before in its history since it was formed, you know, in the 1700s uh, as um, taking away a right that had been conferred. It had very often provided a right, overturned precedent to provide a right, um, like Brown versus the Board of Education, which was a wonderful decision, but never before taken away a right. Um, so, you know, basically uh, the court said that <clears throat> um, the right to abortion was not part of the history and traditions of America. Um, and therefore it couldn't be a, a constitutional right. Of course, I totally disagree with that. I believe that, um, you know, the, the right to autonomy and to privacy um, and the right to reproductive and other forms of sexual health are extraordinarily important. Um, they should be constitutional protections. Um, beyond that, the court hinted um, that what might be at stake in the future are other constitutional rights, including things like um, same-sex marriage or even contraception or certain forms of contraception like IUDs because all of these rights were based upon the same uh, underpinning as Roe versus Wade, which is the right to privacy. And I just wanna say one other thing. I've always thought that um, abortion rights were really about autonomy and privacy and the physician patient relationship and the sanctity of that relationship. But I've come to think that it's a lot more than that. This is not just a question of individual autonomy or privacy. It's a question now of justice, of equity and fairness, because any woman in America with means will most likely be able to get an abortion no matter where she lives. But that's not true um, for poor people, um, uh, disproportionately people of color, it's not true for many poor rural um, residents. Um, and so we're really seeing two Americas, uh, one that can have access to the health services they need and one that can't. Thank you for that. Dr. Perret, I want to give space with and Dr. Perret or uh, Upadhyay, I wanted to also join in in that question and conversation. I think it's so, it's thank you so much for that. Professor Gostin, because it's a really important point to make when we talk about what the impact is going to be, who the impact is going to be on. And we've seen this play out already for decades. I agree that it's not about privacy or um, when we think about access to abortion. It's never it's not even about abortion, right? This is this is about power, it's about control. And honestly, it's rooted in stratified reproduction and the desire to increase births in some communities and decrease births in others. And that can be counterintuitive to folks, right? How can abortion bans disproportionately impacting black women and birthing people um, be part of this larger um, plan uh, for stratified reproduction? But it's important to understand that we are um, a byproduct 
of these bands, right? And, and the power and control that is attempting to be exercised over every person with the power to reproduce definitely disproportion, disproportionately impacts some communities as opposed to others. Uh, and the, the, the further we can zoom out of that conversation, I think that the better we'll be. The other thing that I would add is that, you know, we've spent a lot of time, especially in the last month, talking about the overturn of Roe. And as as we've heard from previous panelists already, Roe has never been enough, right? We focus so much of our energy on protecting Roe and it did provide federal protections, but there are folks that have been living in this country where Roe was essentially non-existent for a very long time. And because all of our focus has been focused, all of our focus has been focused on protecting Roe, uh, it has been a distraction and we have ignored the state level restrictions in the thousands that have been passed in the last 10 years that are essentially banning abortion already. Roe is the floor, Roe was the floor. And what we know now is that floor is gone. And so the question becomes, what will we build in its place? And I believe very strongly that people who provide abortions and people who have abortions should be leading this conversation about designing new systems that will benefit all of us. Thank you, Dr. Ray. Go ahead, Dr. Padia. Yeah, I was just gonna um, add one thing to uh, what Dr. Parrott said, um, and now it has slipped my mind, so. <laughs> That's okay, it happens to me quite often, so don't worry lately. So we, we can come, if, if it know, comes I, to I, you. Recall. So, you know, I think it. It, it's especially important to this conversation too, assuming that a lot of physicians are the ones watching this podcast, I think, what Dr. Parrott just highlighted is something that is really important. And I think we as a medical community need to really take some responsibility and really understand and see what abortion providers have been dealing with um, over many, many years, um, as she said, that we would not accept in any other aspect of healthcare. Um, you know, providers well before Roe v. Wade, providers have been providing, you know, mandated by the state to provide incorrect medical, you know, information to patients. Um, they have been mandated to provide substandard care by laws. That is something that has been going on and folks have been dealing with it. And I think as a medical community, um, we really need to take responsibility and really stand, um, stand behind those folks who have been doing this work and um, who continue to do it now under even greater amounts of threat. Um, but I think that's something that a lot of folks in medicine don't really understand um, what abortion providers have been dealing with, you know, well before um, June 24th. You know, that brings up uh, the point of and the importance of um, narratives and storytelling and explicit um, action around that. Oftentimes, I think in medicine, you know, we undervalue and probably in other disciplines undervalue the power of being able to use and elevate um, stories of folks to help change and inspire um, or inspire to create change, right? I, I used to teach um, community organizing and public health and Meredith Minkler um, is, it wrote the book. She's a well-known professor in the space. And she always says, you know, institutions may be moved by numbers but people move by stories. Um, and so that's the same. And I think about the political environment um, and again, connecting those dots. And you'll hear me talk much more about kind of political determinants, organizing, all these things that we weren't taught in med school that are really important to how we were able to advance, you know, medicine and really um, aspire to equity. And so, um, you know, Professor Agostin, I, I wanted to speak to you and just, you know, in, in your space and in the legal space, and you're writing in JAMA, so clearly you understand the value of doing that. But what are things that, you know, you think are really important for the medical community and the audience to know? How would you like to work more so with the medical community and an audience um, as we start to kind of hopefully build a sense of solidarity, uh, a greater sense of solidarity in doing this work? Yeah, I mean, I think traditionally, um, you know, medicine and, you know, doctors and other healthcare professionals have thought of law as um, as as the enemy, um, and lawyers in particular, you know, with all you know, ambulance chasers, me medical malpractice, and all of that. Um, I think America. I think all. I'm not interested in 
in in in those areas. I think America is far too litigious. I think all of the medical malpractice and tort litigation uh, has very little value. Um, but law is an essential, literally an essential ingredient for making a population healthy. Um, uh, Dr. Parrott and others have talked about other examples of that as you have um, in terms of um, the commercial determinants of health, you know, um, big business, environmental determinants of health, um, social um, uh, and economic and racial determinants of health. But law is extraordinarily important. Law help, you know, can provide uh, rights and justice and access to health services, or it can block them. Um, it can incentivize um, healthcare professionals and patients um, to um, work together and to and to and to make uh, a, a healthy a healthy population, or they can they can block it. Uh, they can criminalize it. Um, and we've and the law has been too often on the side of sanctions and criminalization. Everything from now we're talking about abortion and some of the bounty uh, laws, like in Texas, that provide ten thousand dollars to anybody who can sue uh, an abortion provider. Um, but we've seen it also in HIV/AIDS, um, in drug dependency, uh, opioids, in a whole range of other areas as well. Um, so uh, we need to work together um, and we need to work together to ensure a more favorable legal environment where people can have the, all of the determinants of health that make us a healthy, safe and, and uh, population with both physical health and mental health. Thank you. Um, Dr. Perez, I saw you put your your unmute your mic. So I, I want to give you space, you know, to add on to what Professor Gostin said, or or and, and that's something else that you may want to have said as well. But thank yeah. you, Professor Gostin, for that those words. It's, it's really interesting, right? Because I think depending on where you're sitting, the idea that the law can be a tool for liberation is debatable. And the same thing happens for medicine. I think many of our community think I, I came into the practice of medicine. I became a doctor because I believe in it in the same way that Dr. Gostin said as a tool of liberation. And I also understand and acknowledge that there are many folks who totally disagree with me because of the harm that has been enacted by medical providers, perpetrated by medical providers um, upon many communities, certainly in the United States and around the world. And so one of the challenges that I see both with law and medicine and particularly the, the coming together of law and medicine, how do we grapple with those harms, those the history and the ongoing harms that are occurring at the hands of both of these, um, provide service providers, legal providers and medical providers uh, in our communities and work to use it for in the way that we came to it, right? Believing that it can be liberatory for our communities. And I would offer that the first step is really in, in something that Professor Gostin mentioned in his opening question, this word human rights. Um, because the very, the big difference in how we think about healthcare delivery in this country and the reason we spend so much money uh, on healthcare and have still abysmal outcomes, particularly when you pull about pull out racial and ethnic inequities, is because we don't believe that healthcare is a human right. And so we don't approach it that way. One of the things that is so amazing and refreshing and powerful for me about the reproductive justice movement is that it is grounded in human rights theory and black feminist thought. So this understanding that human rights are indivisible. That means you, you must, in order to achieve one, you have to be able to achieve another. Human rights are universal. Everyone everywhere is entitled to them. If you believe that access to abortion care and reproductive health care more broadly is a human right, uh, and it is inalienable, it is indivisible, uh, it is universal, then the person living in rural Mississippi should have the same access that the person living in Midtown New York regardless of documentation, regardless of income, regardless of race and ethnicity. So unless we can really start to grapple with that and wrap our mind around healthcare as a human right, 
and reproductive health care under that umbrella, we have such a long way to go. That was beautifully stated. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you can tell I believe it. I'm slightly passionate about it. <laughs> um, so this the conversation moves very quickly, and I, you know, we're we're at the at the very kind of tail end of the show. And, and Dr. Upadi, I want to give you some space to answer or respond to any of that. But as you respond, um, and I'll go to each one of you, you know, it's it's one of those questions that sometimes you're like, why are we getting asked that question? But it's about hope, right? The reality is, is that most of, we, we cannot do this work of justice unless we have some sense of hope and belief of something better and all the context that Dr. Parrott just mentioned. And so I would love to for you all to just kind of elevate what are just, what's that kind of one thing that's kind of given you hope still at this moment? Um, as we move forward. But Dr. Upadia, I, I turn to you first. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I'll two, briefly two things um, I think that are giving me hope. Um, I think one is the work of, um, you know, abortion providers across the country, um, both within Planned Parenthood and outside of it. Um, I think the, you know, the, the dedication and creativity and persistence um, that they continue to demonstrate in support of their patients, um, and in the face of serious threats is really remarkable and inspiring. And I think, um, you know, I, I can say it better, obviously, than Dr. Parrott about, um, you know, this is a human, this is a human right. Um, health, abortion is health care at the, you know, at the, at the, at the base and health care is a human right. And I think, um, you know, we as a medical community need to really stand firmly in that and behind that and really be a part of the solution here. Um, and then just really briefly, I think the other thing that I, that gives me hope is, you know, the history, just, you know, being aware of history and mm -hmm. um, the history of struggle, you know, in my family, certainly um, well aware of the history of colonialism and people struggle against that. And obviously, you know, as an American, um, you know, I endeavor to be aware of the history of enslaved people and their continuous, you know, the continuous struggle against um, oppression and, and people continue to, um, you know, fight back against these systems and and and, and and that is something that continues to give me hope as well. Thank you. Uh, Professor Gostin? Uh, well, you know, Martin Luther King um, said two things that I, well, so many things I love, but two that I often think about. Um, you know, one of them is, is that, um, you know, you know, everybody has, um, you know, the, the right to human rights, um, equality and justice, but nothing is more special among the many things that we think of um, with equality and justice than health, uh, public health and access to health care. I thought that was a very prescient thing that he said. The other thing I, tr I think of is, is that he says that history always the arc of history always bends toward justice. And it's very, it's hard to see that now <laughs> um, with a, a six to three supermajority uh, in the Supreme Court um, and, and uh, so many other things. But I will say this, that, you know, on abortion access, if you look around the world, um, the United States is actually the outlier. Um, most countries have expanded reproductive access services, uh, uh, expanded uh, access to reproductive health services. You know, even countries that are very religious like uh, Ireland um, has, has placed that in their constitution. Um, so I hope that over, over time, um, we will learn from our mistakes and we will, we will strive to do better as a nation. Um, right now, it's, it's very, very hard to see with so many things going on and it can be depressing, but the important thing for all of us is, is that um, you, we never give up. We always keep fighting and we, oh, and, and beyond anything, um, we fight for fairness and justice. I don't think there's anything more important in our society than the idea that everyone has an equal shot. Thank you. Dr. Parrott? 
Sure. Um, I, I love this question because I, it's not one that we often have an opportunity to do in medical spaces, right? It's not, it's only in uh, my, I, I was raised and spent a, a good deal of my formative years um, in Black feminist traditions. And because of our current circumstances, wherever you are in the arc of history, um, there is always a need to dream for a future that is different, that is bigger, that is broader, that is um, more encompassing that will hold us all. And that opportunity we don't give to medical students, to trainees, we don't do it in our offices. We don't vision for uh, um, a future of healthcare delivery uh, in the same way that we do in many organizing spaces. So when we have the opportunity to do it, I'm grateful for it. The thing that gives me the most hope, I think, is it's gonna sound a little counterintuitive, um, but it's because I mentioned row is the floor and the floor is gone. When the bottom falls out, what do you have left? So we're now dealing with generations of people. And my mother told me years ago, like Jamila, you can't, don't get in a fight with somebody with nothing to lose, right? We're dealing with generations of people now with nothing to lose. Before, you know, we heard this ruling a month ago, uh, there were only some people who did not have access to this care. And, Dr. and, and Professor Gostin mentioned it, those with means, those with resources, uh, those with connections, have always and will always get abortion care. Now everybody is at risk. And so this is an opportunity to build community in a different way, to make sure that we are all in this fight together and to understand what it means that, that there is no individual liberation without collective liberation. Those things are deeply tied and that is the only way forward. We have to understand the connection to one another and center those who are most marginalized from care who are at the margins as we're thinking about what the future looks like. That vision must center those folks. Well, thank you all. Um, thank you, Dr. Perret, for that and the closing remarks. Um, I appreciate you all and taking time out of your very busy schedule at this moment at all times, but especially at this moment. Thank you all for, for tuning in um, and um, being with us throughout this series that has grown tremendously. Uh, so thank you for your time and energy until the next time, Dr.